Welcome to the Healthy Libraries program. Today, we're gonna to talk about the COVID-19 vaccines. Um, just to tell a little bit about us, um, we are the Stony Brook Medicine's Healthy Libraries program, which is a partnership with the Public Libraries of Suffolk County, the Suffolk Cooperative Library System Outreach Services Department, and is supported in part by the American Heart Association of Long Island. The program is an interdisciplinary team of public health, nursing, social work, and library science students whose aim is to provide evidence-based health information screening case management to to a diverse community of patrons and refer patrons to promote access to appropriate health and social services. This is just a little bit about the team who created this PowerPoint. We have Winnie, who is a social worker student, and then Amanda, Dylan, Titi, and Chris. We are um, the nursing students. So these are just our objectives um, for today. So by the end of this webinar, participants will be able to identify mRNA COVID-19 vaccine, identify the amount of days between dose one and dose two of the different types of COVID-19 vaccines, identify who is eligible for the COVID-19 vaccine, identify the common side effects of the COVID-19 vaccines, and identify if the COVID-19 vaccine interacts with DNA. So to begin, we're just gonna talk a little bit about what a vaccine is in general. A vaccine is any preparation intended to produce immunity to a disease and prevent the disease in the future. Vaccines are designed to reduce or eliminate disease caused by infectious organisms. No vaccine is 100% safe or effective. However, vaccines are an excellent defense against infectious disease. In general, the benefits of a vaccine far exceed the risks posed by the disease. So, a major question that a lot of people ask is how were the COVID-19 vaccines developed so quickly? So in developing the vaccine, they were not starting from scratch. The vaccine candidates were previously developed and studied against the 2003 uh, SARS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome and other viruses. Um, additionally, data transparency played a role as the SARS-CoV-2 genetic code was rapidly shared with scientists globally. So many people were participating to find a cure um, for a vaccine. High rates of COVID-19 infection helped scientists to develop the vaccine quickly, meaning there were plenty of cases to carry out trials. Researchers study vaccine effic efficacy by comparing the number of infections in people who get the vaccine versus people who did not get the vaccine. Vaccines against rare diseases are studied for many years before there are enough infections to measure the efficacy. Right now, COVID-19 is not so rare, so researchers have data sooner. So COVID-19 mRNA-based vaccines, those are the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine that everyone um, has been hearing about. So messenger RNA, also known as mRNA-based vaccines, take advantage of the process that cells use to make proteins in order to trigger an immune response. mRNA from the vaccine never enters the nucleus of the cell and therefore does not affect or interact with a person's DNA. Vaccinated individuals develop an Im immune response to the spike protein, and when exposed to SARS-CoV-2, they, they are protected from the infection. mRNA is then broken down and naturally cleared by the human body. mRNA technology is new, but not unknown, and has been studied for more than a decade. mRNA vaccines do not contain live virus and do not carry a risk for causing disease. And like I said before, Pfizer and Moderna are the two that are using this technology. So for the Pfizer vaccine, um, in order to get it there, you're allowed to be 16 years and older. You need two doses in order for it to be effective and they're separated by 21 days. And if your first dose of the vaccine was Pfizer, your second has to be Pfizer. So that means you can't mix the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine. Additionally, preliminary data suggests that the high, that high vaccine efficacy of 95% in preventing COVID-19 following the two dose series. For Moderna, you have to be 18 years old or older. Again, it's two doses separated by 28 days. And if your first dose of the vaccine was Moderna, your second has to be Moderna. For this one, they had a 94.1% um, efficacy in preventing COVID-19 following the two dose series. So there, it's the same exact contraindications and precautions um, for both Moderna and Pfizer. So the contraindications of getting the vaccine would be if you have a severe allergic reaction to a previous dose or component of either mRNA COVID-19 vaccine, an immediate allergic reaction of any severity to a previous dose or component of an mRNA COVID-19 vaccine, or an immediate allergic reaction of any severity to polysorbate 
um, due to potential cross reactivity hypersensitivity with the vaccine ingredient PEG. Some precautions would be a history of immediate allergic reaction to any other vaccine or injectable therapy um, that are not related to a component of mRNA COVID-19 vaccines and moderate to severe acute illness. If you're not sure if you qualify for any of these, you would speak to your um, primary care provider and they can um, guide you. Just to do some um, similarities and differences between the two vaccines, the similarities between Pfizer and Moderna is that they're both administered intramuscularly in the deltoid muscle. Um, they have the same exact contraindications and precautions. After you receive both of these, you're going to be um, observed for 15 or 30 minutes for the, um, after the vaccination. Um, they're both mRNA vaccines and it's a two dose series. A few of the differences is just that Pfizer is separated by 21 days, Moderna is separated by, uh, sorry, Pfizer is separated by 21 days, Moderna is separated by 28 days. Um, Pfizer is for 16 years and older, Moderna is for 18 years and older. Pfizer is stored at a colder temperature um, than Moderna, and Pfizer is 0.3 milliliters of a dosage, and Moderna is 0.5 milliliters. Um, and then lastly, there's two other vaccines that are in the works in phase three of the clinical trials. That's the University of Oxford, AstraZeneca, and Johnson & Johnson. Um, these are the COVID-19 adenovirus vectored vaccines. And these vaccines use a genetically modified and weakened adenovirus to carry the genes encoding the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. Similar to mRNA vaccines, vaccinated individuals develop immune responses to the spike protein. I'm going to pass it over to the next um, nursing student. So, hi everyone. You're muted, Amanda. <laughs> Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> um, my name is Amanda. I'm also a nursing student. So, I know we talked a little bit about uh, um, before about how the vaccines were made quickly. So, we're going to provide a timeline for you guys. So for the Pfizer um, BioNTech vaccine testing, the reason why they were able to start the vaccine so quickly is because they already had the genetic sequence. On January 12th, the um, China government shared the genetic sequence of the virus, which allowed the scientists to make the vaccine quicker. Um, as of March 11th, um, Pfizer started testing the vaccine on animals. March 17th, um, the company sent out a letter of intent about why they were going to make the vaccines and what their plan of action was. On April 23rd, phase one and two of the trial started in Germany and up to 200 people were tested between the ages of 18 and 55. Um, May 4th, in the United States, there were 360 people tested between the ages of 18 to 85. Uh, June 28th, phase three trial began. On August 12th, data from the early stages of the trials showed the vaccine had a high immune response, which meant that people were becoming immune to the COVID virus. On October 27th, uh, the phase three trials were completed and they had over 43,000 volunteers. On November 9th, um, the data showed that the vaccine was 90% effective on individuals throughout the trial. November 18th, the final results showed 95% efficiency. And on November 20th, Pfizer uh, BioNTech applied for emergency use authorization. So it's very similar to Moderna. So they found out um, early on in January about the genetic sequencing. So they were able to start testing. Um, February 7th, they completed their first batch of the vaccine, um, a total of 25 days from the sequence selection to vaccine manufacture. So it only took them 25 days from when they found out what the genetic sequence was uh, to start creating it. As of March 4th, the FDA uh, reviewed their application and allowed the Moderna to undergo clin clinical trials. On March 16th, the first participant in phase one was dosed with Moderna. As of uh, March 27th, 2020, um, a university in Atlanta agreed to begin enrolling healthy adult uh, volunteers ages 18 to 55 in their phase one study. 
On April 16th, they expanded phase one to include adults between the ages of 56 and 70, and then later on adults older, older than 71. May 18th, Moderna announced positive data from phase one. Uh, May 29th, the first participants in phase two were dosed. On September 8th, Moderna signed a pledge to continue to make the safety and well-being of vaccinated individuals the top priority in development of the first COVID-19 vaccines. And on November 16th, um, the study came to an end and their data showed that they had a 94.5% effective rate. Okay, so what makes people currently eligible for the vaccine? So the first phase was phase 1A that included healthcare workers, uh, residents and staff in certain group living facilities. Um, so nursing homes and various congregating care facilities. And phase 1B, which we're in right now, individuals over the age of 65, grocery store employees, first responders, uh, preschool through 12th grade school employees, college, child care, and early intervention employees, public transit employees, individuals living and working in homeless shelters. As of February 2nd, essential workers, including taxi and TLC licensed drivers. And very recently, we have, um, as of February 15th, individuals with underlying conditions and comorbidities. And for the conditions and comorbidities, comorbidities, there are a lot. So we provided them here for you just to give you a better understanding of who exactly is qualified. So individuals with cancer, current or in remission, including 9-11 related cancers, individuals with chronic kidney disease, uh, pulmonary disease, including but not limited Green. to PD. Pulmonary. Uh, Dr. Dose. Pulmonary. Yeah. Uh, pulmonary disease, including but not limited to COPD. Um, pulmonary fibrosis, cystic fibrosis, 9-11 related pulmonary diseases, uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities, including Down syndrome, heart conditions, including but not limited to heart failure, coronary artery disease, cardiomyopathies or hypertension, which is high blood pressure. Um, individuals who are immunocompromised, they have a weakened immune system, including but not limited but not limited to solid organ transplant or blood or bone marrow transplant individuals, those with immune deficiency, HIV, use of corticosteroids, or use of other immune weakening medicines. And the list continues. So individuals who are severely obese, that means that you have a um, body mass index of 40 kilograms or higher, uh, or a BMI of over 30. Individuals who are pregnant qualify, those with sickle cell disease or thalassemia, type one or type two diabetics, individuals with cere cerebral vascular disease, uh, neurological conditions, including but not limited to Alzheimer's or dementia and individuals with liver disease. Okay, so um, so far we've heard a lot about the um, corona vaccine and now we can tell that the vaccine is safe and effective and most people do not have any side effects while um, others report um, mild um, side effects. And some of the side effects that you should expect are pain or swelling at injection sites, headaches and chills and a low grade fever. For the pain and swelling, you can actually use a clean, cool, wet washcloth, put it over the area um, just to suit the area, as well as exercising the arm can help um, reduce the swelling and the pain. For the headaches and low-grade fever, Tylenol is also recommended and also to drink a lot of fluid. Um, these reactions are very common and seen in most vaccines. And after getting the COVID-19 shots, you would have to wait for 15 to 30 minutes to be observed for um, severe reactions. There will be medical teams on site to respond to any emergencies, but these are extremely rare. Um, the CDC recommends that you get your COVID vaccine as soon as you're eligible. Um, so CDC also recommends that we continue to, uh, to follow the three important steps to slow the spread of the virus and 
the three W's, which is wash your hands, wear masks, and watch your distance, meaning stay six feet away from others that you do not live with. And with the new variants of the COVID-19 virus, the CDC are also recommending double maxing and also knotting the hair loops of a medical max where they're attached to the max edges and then tucking in and flattening the extra material close to the face. This will help improve the feet of this max and better protect you. Um, so why should you continue to follow these guidelines after getting the second shot of your vaccine? Even after you're vaccinated against COVID-19, you may still be exposed to the virus that causes COVID-19. And after exposure, people can be infected with or carry the virus that causes COVID-19, but do not feel sick or have any symptoms, meaning you're still able to transmit this virus and infect others. Um, so reporting COVID-19 vaccine symptoms, there is a system that the CDC are using right now, which is called VSAFE. VSAFE uses text messaging and web surveys to provide personalized health check-ins after you receive your COVID-19 virus. Through VSAFE, you can report any side effects after getting the vaccine. Depending on the severity of your symptoms, someone from CDC will reach out to you to check on you and provide medical follow-up. To register for VSAFE, you would need a smartphone and you'd have to go to the website vsafe.cdc.gov and they have a step-by-step -step instructions for you to register for VSAFE. And um, CDC also has um, the National Healthcare Safety Network, which is basically an infection control tracking system, which includes an acute and long-term care facility monitoring system that will allow for them to determine COVID-19 vaccine adverse events reporting cases. And in case of any emergency, please do call 911. Hey everybody, I'm Chris. I'm a nursing student as well. And uh, I'm just going to be going over a couple of, um, there's a big a movement against uh, why you shouldn't get the vaccine. And people are saying things such as like it alters your DNA, but I'm just going to go over like the actual facts of why these uh, statements are false. Um, so one of the arguments, is, as I said, is um, vaccine alters your DNA. And uh, the answer to that uh, argument is COVID-19 mRNA vaccines do not change or interact with your DNA in any way. Uh, messenger RNA vaccines, also called mRNA vaccines, are the first COVID-19 vaccines authorized for use in the United States. mRNA vaccines teach our cells how to make a protein that triggers an immune response. The mRNA, the mRNA for, form a COVID-19 vaccine never enters the nucleus of the cell which is where our DNA is kept. This means the mRNA cannot affect or interact with our DNA in any way. And that's from the CDC website. Um, another argument is the vaccine can negatively affect our ability to get pregnant. And the answer to that is uh, the COVID-19 vaccine, like other vaccines, works by training our bodies to develop antibodies to fight against the virus that causes COVID-19 to prevent future illnesses. There is currently no evidence that antibodies form from the COVID-19 vaccine can cause any problems with pregnancy, including the development of the placenta. In addition, there's no evidence suggesting that fertility problems are a side effect of any vaccine. People who are trying to become pregnant now or who, who plan to try in the future may receive the COVID-19 vaccine when it becomes available to them. That is also found on the uh, CDC website. Um, another argument that uh, many people use is the vaccine was rushed, so it isn't effective or safe. Um, and the answer to that is both of the current vaccines are about 95% effective. Uh, so they're both effective. And in regards to safety, despite being rushed, the record and the record time it took to develop the vaccines, both vaccines went through all the necessary safety steps uh, that any other vaccine needed to go through. And there are many reasons for this quick pro process, including the ample research resources provided to the researchers, the facts, the fact that the companies did multiple research steps at one time to allow for a shorter time frame, and the huge amount of data over the short period of time, given the number of cases. On top of this, you have the new advances in technology and the fact that previous mRNA vaccines have been developed, so there was a, blue, a blueprint to go off of. And that's from uh, 
uh, John Hopkins Medicine uh, website. And then uh, a fourth argument is if I already got COVID, my body developed antibodies, so I can't get it again and don't need the vaccine. And the answer to this is uh, clinical evidence shows that uh, reinfection is possible. You may develop natural immunity, but the evidence shows that this immunity isn't permanent, at least not in everyone, as evidenced by the multiple reinfected cases. Evidence even suggests that this natural immunity may only last a short period of time. Experts believe as little as 90 days. So even if you have been infected, you should get, you should still get vaccinated if possible. And that's uh, from the C CDC. Hi everybody, my name is Winnie and I'm a social work student. So I'm sure that many of us are wondering, how do I register for the COVID vaccine? So the first step one must take is to go to the New York State Department Health's website. It's uh, amieligible.covid19vaccine.healthnewyork.gov. And at the bottom of the page, you would click the blue get started button. From there, you would fill out approximately seven questions regarding your personal information and you would click submit. At that point, it will let you know if you are eligible to receive the vaccine and should allow you to choose a time and location to receive your vaccination. Appointment availability changes frequency, frequently based on vaccine supply. Once you have a confirmed appointment, you will need to fill out the New York State COVID-19 vaccine form. For detailed instructions, visit the state's website on phase distribution on the vaccine. So these are some of the state-run vaccination locations. Um, the closest ones here um, would be the one in Stony Brook, um, New York City, and the Wontog. Um, but there's also locations all throughout the state, including um, Syracuse, Albany, White Plains, Potsdam, Plattsburgh, Johnson City, Utico, Buffalo, and Henrietta. Um, so vaccines are available at select pharmacies such as CVS, Dwayne Reed, Walgreens, and Stop and Shop, and um, at Costco and Rite Aid in New York City only. So you can check the CDC for updates on participating pharmacies. COVID-19 testing, testing in Suffolk County. Um, so you can go um, to the Health Services Department website and it contains links and contact information for testing sites such as walk-in clinics, pharmacies, and to the New York State COVID-19 test site finder. It also has locations for antibody testing. Um, it provides links to local, state, and federal COVID-19 related social assistance. And for more vaccination information, you can go to the Suffolk County website, and it also includes links and phone numbers for scheduling a vaccination appointment through the state. It also includes an extensive FAQ about the state's vaccination phases, the vaccines, and eligibility. And if you need additional guidance, you can also call the New York State COVID-19 vaccine hotline. And in Suffolk County, you can just dial 311. And remember, COVID-19 vaccines are free to everyone. Next, I'm just going to talk about the uh, recent uh, cases and numbers of COVID in New York State. Um, so on February um, 22nd, there were 6,146 new cases of COVID for a daily positivity rate of 4.33, um, 1,142,019 1 total tests were conducted that day, which is steadily declining and has dropped significantly since the holiday season. Um, in New York State, there were 5,804 patients in the hospital for COVID, um, with 1,148 of them in the ICU, 14 less than the previous day. Uh, 780 of, of them are on, the, are on mechanical ventilation, and that's also for February uh, 22nd. And then um, 89 New Yorkers uh, died from uh, COVID on February 22nd. Now we're going to move on to questions and I'm going to start, um, some of the questions have already been answered by the students in the chat, but I think we should start um, from the top, go through all the chat questions and then if anyone, you can also unmute yourself and ask questions. So at the beginning of the presentation, someone asked, what is the difference between emergency approval versus the normal approval process for the vaccine? 
this hi this is denise snow i'm a nurse um a faculty at stony brook um so the question is what's the difference between uh emergency approval for uh, a drug um uh, the um fda has a very uh lengthy process for approving uh medications in the u.s some of these vaccines have been uh, uh developed in other countries as well as the US. So there's that layer of, of the um, uh, development. Uh, but some of the uh, some of the usual hurdles that uh, pharmaceutical companies go through with the FDA have been expedited so that the vaccines could uh, go through very, very rapidly. So that is the emergency uh, approval is that uh, the various uh, requirements from the FDA have been done in an expedited manner. It doesn't mean that they're less safe and they haven't been tested. It's just that um, any barriers to approval were uh, reduced for the vaccines. And also just to comment, this isn't the first time that there has been um, an emergency approval for other drugs. So right. like the first time the FDA issued an emergency approval was in 2005 for the anthrac, anthrax vac vaccine. And also in 2009, the FDA issued um, emergency approval for Tamiflu, which is used to treat um, the flu virus. And it was done for um, for infants during the H1N1 pandemic. So this isn't the first time that the FDA has given emergency approval for um, vaccines or other um, drugs. So the next question is, do children below 16 get the vaccine? And Amanda answered this in the chat. I don't know, Amanda, if you want to read your answer. Yeah, I can read my answer. So um, as of right now, ch um, children below 16 are not getting the vaccine, um, but Pfizer recently has just started doing clinical trials for children as young as 12 years old. So I'm sure they'll be doing that probably for the next few weeks, few months, and then more data will come out as to if and when they're going to be vaccinating children. Um. And then the next question is, the CDC this month has reported several hundred deaths in the U.S. of people who have received the vaccines. Are there any official reports of the outcomes of any related studies or investigations concerning these? So I was just reading about this, actually, and um, it says that people have died, yes, recently, um, that had the vaccine, but through uh, um, autopsies and the medical records, there's no findings showing that because of the vaccine, there was a link um, to their death. So the vaccine didn't cause their death necessarily. I wanted to just add to that too. I was just sure. reading the same thing from the CDC. Um, so it was saying out, out of the 113 deaths that have been reported, um, 78 of them were individuals who lived in long-term care facilities. So like people who live in like nursing homes and things like that. So people who are older, who are more often than not are going to pass away just to, just due to natural causes. Um, but yeah, as Dylan said, they said they looked at the, uh, the medical records and autopsy reports and there was no correlation between the vaccine and their cause of death. Also to add to that, many of those people uh, only got the first dose of the vaccine, so they didn't have the full protection. And um, the COVID-19 vaccine would not protect you against other conditions. So many of them also had other illnesses um, that has led to their death. But there is not been an actual correlation or an association with the vaccine and the cause of death. Um, the next question is, is there any firm estimate as to how long immunity can be expected from each vaccine? I don't think that's um, really known just yet, just because it is still so new. Um, so I don't know if anyone else has any like more knowledge on that, but 
from my understanding, they're not too sure just yet. Yeah, they're still doing a lot of research uh, on that. So we actually don't know yet. Um, we could have to um, take like booster vaccines after like a couple of years. We might have to get it annually, like the flu shot. They don't know exactly right now, but a lot of studies are being done to uh, figure that out. Yeah, and it is a relatively you know, newer vaccine. So it's gonna take a little bit of time to figure out how long the immunity will last. Um, the next question is, are both doses of the Moderna vaccine the same or is the second doses make up different from the first? The doses are the same. You get the same. If you get the Pfizer dose, you have to get the same one for your second dose and it's the same. And it's the same makeup, same um, dosage. Um, so nothing is different between your first dose and your second dose. Um, the next question is, the New York Times reported that that those who were diagnosed with COVID should only get the first dose of the vaccine and not the second. I'm not sure if that's correct. Um, from my understanding, um, if you had COVID, the CDC um, recommends waiting till you're done with COVID in order to get your vaccine, but you can get both doses. Um, but if you had the, um, the treatment for it during it, the antibody treatment, then you should be waiting three months before you um, receive your vaccines. Yeah, so and also just doing a quick search to see. Um, it says studies suggest that if you have have had COVID, that you might already have immunity and therefore would only need one additional dose to get that like 95% immunity. But those are studies suggest. So um, that might not be confirmed yet. That's like preliminary data. So that's not what the CDC is recommending. And um, if you have the opportunity to get the COVID vaccine, you should get both doses. And then the last question is, um, if someone is diagnosed with COVID-19, isn't it risky for them to be vaccinated? So you should not get the vaccine while um, you're still testing positive to COVID. You would have to wait till you test negative. Uh, like Dylan said, if you're undergoing the antiviral therapy, you should wait um, for three months. Uh, and also I think it says 10 days after you quarantine from COVID, even if you don't have symptoms, um, you should have to wait for that long before you get the vaccine. Um, and then the next question, if the length of immunity can't be determined yet, could there be risks from having multiple shots throughout the year? From my understanding, I don't think um, that it would be a risk of having multiple shots. Um, maybe Professor Snow might have more knowledge on this just from her experience. Um, but yeah. I would also say that since, you know, a lot of people are trying to get vaccinated, if you get, get your first vaccination, like your first set of the two vaccines, then I would wait um, so that other people can get vaccinated. And then um, when they recommend doing a second round of vaccines, that's when you would go and do it. Because the idea is that enough people will get vaccinated so that we have herd immunity. Um, and that's like a common thing with vaccines. Other, you know, like common diseases like polio, they vaccinated so many people um, so that, you know, polio is no longer common in the US. So that's the idea so that, you know, 80% of the population will get vaccinated and then, um, you know, COVID will, you know, not be as common. Um, so, but that only happens when a lot of people get vaccinated. So I think it's important to, you know, let everyone get vaccinated. But uh, Dr. Snow, I don't know if you want to comment. Uh, no, I think I think that that uh, that's exactly right. Um, so no additional comments. All right. Um, is there any other questions? There's no more questions in the chat, but um, we have, you know, uh, 10 more minutes left till the program ends. And if you have any more questions, please feel free to write it in the chat or- um, There's a hand up. Gabriella, there's a hand up. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, you can just unmute yourself if you have a question. I don't see the hand up. Okay. Uh, this is a, I have a question. If you have a test and you show that you have antibodies, but you, in other words, I've, I've had no signs that I've had it, but if I got an antibody test, how does that affect having a, 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 a vaccination? If, <laughs> if it came up positive. Anybody want to respond? I could respond to that. It, it, it right now it's not affecting. It's um, it would seem in ordinary circumstances if somebody has a positive um, response or has an antibody, uh, what we call an IgG or an IgM to to a particular virus, we think that it probably conveys some sort of immunity. But we know that that's not true with all viruses. Um, for example, there's viruses like um, uh, varicella and herpes zoster. And even if you have shown that you've had the infection and have some immunities, you can still get it again. And that's the assumption that we're going on with um, the COVID uh, virus, that uh, we don't know if somebody's been exposed, had it, even if they show some response to the COVID, it doesn't necessarily convey total immunity and that somebody could get it again. So, so that's the theory. The viruses are, are a little more unpredictable than say a bacteria or whatever, as far as your body recognizing them and responding to them. So that's a great question, Dennis, but honestly, um, you'd still need to get the vaccine even with uh, showing some immunity. Okay, thank you. I, I have an appointment like uh, three weeks from now. And I just wanted to know if it was worthwhile having a antibody test beforehand, but evidently that's not really a, an issue. It, it's not worth your while because you're going to be encouraged to get the vaccine anyway. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, you can um, go. I can go? Yes, okay. sorry. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I'm on, a, on my iPhone, so I can't type in a question. I have lung sarcoidosis, and I have a weakened immune system, and I did see my pulmonologist yesterday. He did recommend me to go get the vaccine, and I am allergic to, like, Vicodin, which I had, like, in the 1980s, and it closed my throat where I had to call the doctor up. It was for back pain, and called him up and said, you know, he told me to take a Benadryl. And of course that's on my record that I can't have Vicodin and nausea and vomiting from Percocet and uh, codeine. And uh, that was when I had surgery for hysterectomy that I threw it up. And then I was uh, given Skelexin one time in 2006 for back pain. I also broke out with hives and rash. So I was just concerned about these allergies. And then I did acquire the Alpha Gary tick uh, thing over the summer, where I was bit by the Lone Star tick three times. I did have the level a little elevated, yes. So the doctor primary care said not to eat meat, you know, for a while. And I got tested five weeks later after the tick bite, which it was a little elevated. So I was just concerned with all these issues with the vaccine. Is it safe for me being I have these allergies? So I heard that you do have a primary care provider. Is that correct? Yes, I do. Have you spoken to them about this? Because with them... Um, no, I did speak to the lung doctor and he recommended me to go get the vaccine, you know, and I was, you know, concerned about, you know, the Vicodin, you know, the medication allergies, if I would get a reaction or anything like that. And then I was curious too about an EpiPen. Would that be benefit too? What if I have a reaction at night or something and there's nobody around? Of course, you dial 911. I do have my husband. You know, do you think an EpiPen is a beneficial to have on hand too when you get, um, you know, the vaccination? Um, some people do bring their EpiPens. Um, my best recommendation would be to go and talk to your primary care provider um, just because they will know your history and your background and have more knowledge on, um, on your history. Um, whereas us nursing students, we don't know as well. Um, but yeah, and then they can guide you on what the best idea would be to do to get it or not. 
Okay. I did see the lung doctor. He did, he did recommend it, you know, and I do work in a school, you know, I haven't been working. I've been sheltering since September. I don't feel comfortable going back in case I, the high school kids are out and about. I am still a little cool about returning to the school. Now, the other question I had is that I have two weddings over the summer. I'm a kind of care, scared to go to them. One is August 6th which has been postponed three times with COVID, my nephew. Another one is, and that's at the East Wind. They're going to try to have it outside. I don't know. I know you're supposed to get a COVID test prior to going. How do you know? You know, I don't know whether um, somebody would be carrying that germ, you know, the COVID at the wedding. You don't know. So I was just concerned, you know, about that, you know, yeah. about going to weddings. Yeah, absolutely. I'm afraid um, to. I think that things are changing so quickly, um, day to day, month to month, week to week. So um, the best advice I have for you for that would be just to wait until it gets closer, um, because maybe we will have a lot more vaccines by then and a lot more people will be vaccinated. Um, and I would just wait to see what the CDC comes out with based on. The yeah, number. I would okay. wait. I agree with Dylan. I would say wait to see what the recommendations and guidelines are in the state for social distancing and large gatherings. And then once that information is available, because August is a few months away, then you can kind of maybe reassess then based on the current information. And keep in mind also about the sarcoidosis that will factor in and you should check in with your primary care provider because you might have special instructions. Okay, now like this week, I'm seeing a cardiologist next Friday uh, because I had thyroid removed in 2014 which left me with palpitations. It took me a year and a half to get adjusted on a thyroid medication, which I'm okay, but that's what I was learning too. Does the COVID-19, uh, I know the, uh, the disease will affect anything in your body, you never know, but will the vaccine affect the heart rate? Have you heard of that for palpitations? I personally haven't heard any um, reports of palpitations. Um, TT mentioned before just the typical symptoms of the arm pain, low grade fever, headache, chills. Um, but from my knowledge, I haven't heard anything about palpitations. Okay. Yeah, it might be a good idea also when you go see the cardiologist to ask about the COVID vaccine and mention all of, you know, all of the things that are going on and see what their opinion is. Um, okay. Because really, we can't offer you any medical advice, but your doctors, you know, your primary care your cardiologist, whoever, they would be the best person um, to consult, especially um, in your case. All right. What do you think about the EpiPen? You know, if anybody, you know, do you think that's a good idea to have on hand? Oh, you know, um, just to reassure you, when you get the vaccine, you have to, as they as they mentioned in the in the slides, you have to be observed for uh, the period of time when most people would have a reaction and there's uh, medical personnel available. So you should feel reassured that everything's in place during the vaccine process. Okay, but sometimes something may happen later on. Like, you know, I know some people that had the vaccine and they said the next day they had sore arm or tired and they stayed home from work and then it lasted one day, then they went to work and they were fine. Yeah, those are typical responses 12 to 24 hours after the vaccine. You're talking about an allergic response, which will happen within the first 30 to 60 minutes. Okay if someone were to have it, which is rare that they have one, but um, it, it. Okay, so if something's gonna happen, you know, with the allergic reaction or something, throat closing or whatever, it'll happen within the uh, half hour. Yeah, and you'll just stay there to be observed longer than somebody else would. I also just wanted to point out that um, someone in the chat commented, if you get vaccinated, do you still have to follow COVID-19 guidelines? And Amanda answered, yes, make sure to still wear a mask or double mask now as the CDC recommends and stay six feet apart. Vaccines aren't 100% effective. They're only about 95% effective, meaning you can still potentially you know, get COVID. There's that 5%. But also if you're immune to COVID, you might still be able to carry the virus and you know, not have any symptoms if you come in contact. So it's important to still 
you know, make sure we're following all of the primary prevention methods, you know, proper hand washing, wearing a mask and staying six feet apart. And then um, someone else is raising their hand and has two sets of questions in the chat. You can either write them in the chat or unmute yourself. No, yeah, I'll unmute, thank you. Um, sorry if, I, if some of these were answered before, but I had to take two calls during the, uh, during the session here, so I may have missed it. Uh, the first set is fairly easy, is that well, my mom already had the second dose. I was wondering what the profile looks like after the doses. How long does it take full effect, kind of like um, after the second dose that she's uh, up to the maximum protection? Is like I hear after the first dose, you have to wait three weeks before you can uh, more or less get the second dose as a booster. I was wondering how, uh, what does the curve look like in terms of protection and how long does it go? Um, is there any studies of how long the protection is good for? So after your second dose, two weeks after that, that's when you are the most protected. Um, that's like your height of protection for the vaccine. Um, so again, two weeks after your second dose, and they're still not really sure how long the immunity is going to last. They're still doing research and studies. So hopefully as time goes on, they'll have a better idea for, uh, as a, to how long it will last. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next kind of question is basically is uh, concerning getting a friend to sign up. Uh, I was fortunate to get my mom a shot excuse me, an appointment, but on the current situation is that he's having a very hard time getting an appointment going through the internet. Is there some other way that, I mean, it's all saying no appointments available or no first, um, no first dose appointments available. How can he get around that to get an appointment? How does your friend qualify? Do they qualify for being older than 65? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so I don't know if you saw this on the presentation, but CVS, Walgreens, and Dwayne Reed are also offering COVID vaccines specifically for individuals who are 65 and older. I don't know if your friend has tried any of their websites yet. Yes, we have. And uh, have you tried it? Because I'm saying I'm trying and uh, it's, uh, yeah, there's, there's not many appointments available. And, and when they are, by the time I call them, it's taken. So, um, in other words, it's, have you tried it? Meaning that is it uh, possible to do I have to try each pharmacy individually, or does it tell me if any of the CVS or Walgreens in that area is open? I mean, has a pit available openings? So it gives you the option to put in your zip code, and when you do that, I think it has an option of how many miles away you want it to look for. So I think it's probably either like 25 or 50. Um, and when you do that, it is going to provide you with the list of all available um, well, stores. I tried, no, no, I tried it that way. It is 25 miles. The red flag says 25 miles <laughs> available, but that's not actually accurate because I've seen, because I've kind of like monitored it and constantly tried. I've gotten the green flag saying there's some, an appointment available, uh, even with red flags elsewhere saying that there's nothing available within 25 miles of that zip code. It's just, it's not very user friendly. It doesn't help get people appointments. It just basically is, you're playing, it feels like you're playing the lottery. Yes, yeah, so unfortunately, because they keep opening it up to um, more people to be eligible for the vaccine, with the limited supply of vaccines, it's difficult for people to get appointments, but keep checking that website daily. Um, I just posted in the chat, um, the COVID-19 vaccination hotline, I would call them as well as people cancel their appointments. Um, th those appointments will open up. Um, they're open, I believe, 7 to 10.30 at night. Um, 7 a.m., sorry, to 10.30 at night. And they can help schedule an appointment too as things open up. He has to keep on calling or will he get a, can it be that he'll get a call back as next in line to get a, on the wait list, no? So it's still hit or miss. Yeah, I don't think that's how they're doing it right now, unfortunately. Right. I just want to prevent the, you know, kind of like the uh, lottery method, excuse me, like the, uh, and, you know, you perpetual calls. It ties up everybody's time. And also, um, like I mentioned in the webinar, there's two other vaccines that are in phase three, so they should be coming out shortly too, which will um, give us more vaccines and more appointments as well. All right. So keep checking them. Thank you. 
but maybe if anyone has one last question before we go. I have one if nobody else has one, but I'll yield to anybody else who has another one. This is Jen. Um, you can ask your question. Okay, thank you then. If nobody else has anything, uh, I was gonna ask about the variants, the, uh, the current vaccine against the variants. I've been hearing conflicting information, but um, what's the latest news on, or what's the latest uh, evidence on whether it's, it's effective against the, uh, uh, the, the two prominent ones that uh, brought up, I guess the UK and South Africa. Those variants, are they protective against those? Uh, thank you. I've been hearing conflicting information about, uh, about the vaccine, whether it covers it or not. I'm sorry, uh, can people hear me all right? Yes, yes. So you're asking if the vaccine's effective against um, other variants. Yeah, I mean, what is the latest? Because I hear different stories on the news, so I'm not sure which is, uh, what's the truth. Um, although although the, the vaccine that you got was initially um, created against the current variant that we know, um, but they said it should still be able to protect against the new variants. Um, they're not 100% sure as to how effective it is, but it's it's shown some protection against the new variants. And but it's still being studied. Is it also more certain that the J, uh, Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine is more effective against the South African variant because it was tested there, or that's uh, my mistake and or misrecalling. I'm not sure about that. Um, I don't believe that's known yet. Yeah. Yeah, I think they're still they're still studying um, the effectiveness of that vaccine. So. Yeah. All right, thank you. All right, Dylan, if you could go to the next slide. So before we go, just um, for everyone that's left, um, I just wanted to say that um, the Stony Brook Medicine Healthy Libraries program, we're available on YouTube, Facebook. We have a website, an email, and a phone number. If you have any health-related questions or need health information, you can schedule a one-on-one -on -one appointment to meet with nursing students, social work students, or public health students. And you can email us at healthy underscore libraries underscore program at stonybrookmedicine.edu or give us a call and leave a message at 631-216-8220. And if you go to YouTube or Facebook, and search Healthy Libraries Program or Stony Brook Medicine Healthy Libraries Program will pop up. Um, and all of our webinars are recorded and posted to our YouTube and Facebook. So you can rewatch um, the programs if you want to, um, you know, refer back to them or share them with other people.